All right, so the basic background here, for, for those who might be a little bit new to this um, idea, is that um, it was really back in, Alicia and I go way back. So back in March of 2013, Alicia and I co-chaired with Dr. Amaral at Mind Institute, the Environmental Epigenetics Symposium, New Frontiers in Autism Research. Can't believe that was 11 years ago. Um, but since then, autism's prevalence has continued to increase. Um, there's increasing evidence that autism is strongly heritable, but not strongly genetic in the classic sense. There's increasing evidence that, it, that autism is generally rooted in transcriptional dysregulation during early brain development, but the reasons for that is poorly understood, and the reasons for the increasing prevalence are poorly understood. The reasons for the strong heritability remain poorly understood. So what we're suggesting is that non-genetic inheritance via parental toxicant exposures, so it really is an environmental paradigm, is a critical but under-investigated question. And I'm gonna to explain to you in the next, I don't know, eight slides um, why that is. Oops, if I can get this to go. So you know, my interest in this came not as a scientist, I'm obviously not a scientist, I'm a, advocate. I'm very involved in the community. I was president of Autism Society San Francisco Bay Area forever. Um, and I just met hundreds and hundreds of autism families. And um, what happened was in December of 2013, I talked to an old college friend who's this woman here who has two daughters with idiopathic autism. And um, she told me that when she was a fetus, basically her mom had to have an appendectomy. And that didn't really strike me as much at the time. I, it kind of lodged in my head. But then I started talking to other moms that I knew and dads that I knew, like this one who said, you know, almost as soon as she was born, she had to undergo two surgeries. Um, and you know, she has, uh, she's also multiplex with two boys uh, uh, with ASD, idiopathic ASD. Then I talked to this mom and they, these guys' mom, and they both had the same exposure which was um, a long-term, uh, or I'm sorry, a long duration surgery for burst appendix um, in their adolescence. And they both have two boys with idiopathic autism. And I met more multiplex families, you know, like this family where the mom had to have multiple surgeries as a child. This mom had to have about seven surgeries and she has a child with idiopathic autism and one with a GRIN1 mutation. And, you know, like this one, same one, the mom had to have multiple surgeries. These were generally female surgeries in nature. And then the rest are simplex families. But again, I saw the same pattern, especially with this fellow here and this fellow here, very, very, very close friends of mine. Both of their fathers had suffered gunshot wounds and had to have a series of successive surgeries um, to address, you know, the damage from the gunshot wounds. And they both have sons with very, very severe idiopathic autism. So, you know, from in, in my mind, um, this idea just kept kind of growing and growing and growing and growing. And, uh, I, but I, I never really thought like, oh, this is something that's causing all autism. Or I never really thought like, this is a, an, uh, an exposure that has a high risk for autism. It would have to be a relatively low risk proposition considering that almost everybody has anesthesia at one point or another. But what I thought I saw, and I could be wrong, was that in some cases, especially with prolonged, repeated, or early life general anesthesia, there seemed to be an increased risk for autism or abnormal, abnormal neurodevelopment in the offspring. Again, very much seemed to be. Um, with a lot of caveats, I ended up surveying 340 autism parents. My methods were very casual. I had no control group aside from sometimes asking about their unexposed siblings and their children. Um, obviously huge risk of confirmation bias. I didn't take myself that seriously. Um, and I also knew that this was not the only phenotype of interest. When I got into this field of inheritance, I was not interested in general anesthesia at all. This was very much an afterthought. But then I started looking into um, uh, you know, modern general anesthesia and that is uh, especially the modern halogenated general anesthetics. These are inhalational anesthetics. They were introduced in the late 1950s, kind of became more popular 
um, in the 60s. And today, the most popular one is sevoflurane, which was introduced around 1992. These are all very rough numbers, and they're also different in different countries. There's also modern intravenous um, general anesthesia, uh, most notably um, you know, propofol, which is really common now introduced in the 80s. And all of these are small lipophilic molecules who action, whose actions are very promiscuous. They definitely reach the gonads. They reach the gonadal support cells and the germ cells. Um, but you know they're intended to suppress the nervous system through various molecular, me molecular mechanisms. They're all a little bit different. Um, and this includes modulation of the, the GABA-A receptors. Um, and then I found out that there were actually studies in the 1980s looking at heritable effects of uh, general anesthesia, in this case, halothane and enflurane. These were done at NYU. And um, these were really small studies done in mice, but they definitely found um, learning impairment in the offspring of the parents who had been exposed. But then there was a 34 year gap where basically nothing happened. And there was no follow up study of this observation. And then what we've seen since then, especially from the lab of Dr. Martin Yuck at the University of Florida, and Lisa Ju was supposed to be on this call, hopefully she'll chime in at some point, um, is uh, a steady stream of studies. And Shaolin Wang just discussed one of them that she did at Emory in the lab of Victor Corsis that finds heritable effects of sevoflurane. All of these more recent studies were done on sevoflurane, which is, again, the most commonly used, at least in the US. Um, of all the inhalational anesthetics. So what they found is, you know, a, a G exposure to parents basically at almost any part, you know, time in their life cycle from the fetal exposure all the way up to a, an adult exposure before conception um, had a relationship to dysregulation of brain development or behavioral traits and or behavioral traits in the F2 offspring with a strong male bias. Not all studies looked at the gender differences, but those that did found a strong male bias in terms of um, the impairments, which you know should be interesting to autism, of course. And then also there's a whole other kind of parallel world just looking at sperm effects of um, exposures like sevoflurane and finding them to be damaging to sperm. Obviously very little on oocytes, <laughs> almost nothing. Oocytes are so forgotten, they're hard to study. Um, and then also at the same time, we see some interesting studies in sperm. There have been three published so far that I know of um, that have found abnormalities in DNA methylation of sperm of fathers with ASD children. There's also just one study, unfortunately just one, I wish there were more, looking at DNA methylation in humans um, mm -hmm. post-surgery. And in uh, those sperm, they found very, very dramatically uh, dramatic shifts in DNA methylation in those sperm uh, before surgery and after. And there's also um, a study from, I think it's UC San Diego, um, finding high mosaicism in autism father sperm, which is also very interesting. So um, I know we're here to talk really about human studies um, and uh, there, there's not really been a human study on this question before. <laughs> um, so I, I, part of my hypothesis was never that the old school anesthetics had a heritable effect. I figured if old school anesthetics had a heritable effect, we would have seen that in increased risk for autism, right? In you know generations before 1980. Um, but nevertheless, I funded a study just looking at this through the Collaborative Perinatal Project cohort. And they did actually find some associations with um, uh, behavioral differences and learning differences in the F2 when the mother had been exposed to surgery in childhood or later. Um, also, one kind of interesting observation of slightly better cognitive scores um, as well. It was sort of a complicated study and it was old data and it's not a perfect study, but I thought that was interesting. So more recently, you know, for, for more recent um, cohorts, um, epide epidemiology has really very consistently seen links between F1, that is the parents' medical history, and F2 risk for ASD. Um, people who have done these studies, some of them are on this call, <laughs> and um, a lot of them have responded to us with interest in this work that, that we continue to do. Um, but we've seen studies looking at general family history across many, many domains. Parental preterm birth um, was associated with a pretty sharply increased risk of ASD. 
maternal abortion history, just under local history, local anesthesia was associated with risk of ASD. And I, one of the more interesting papers I've ever read was on infertility disorders in both males and females and their relationship with ASD risk. And I just pulled this out as an example that here we see um, the odds ratio um, of 3.0 uh, for ASD, um, when the F1 had uh, four conditions, blocked tubes, PCOS, endometriosis, and uterine or related problems, indicating strong associations with ASD, although those were lower among first births. And of course, me being me, I thought, well, you know, these are often, you know, conditions that require surgery, some sort of medical intervention. Could it not be the conditions themselves? Could it have been the intervention that related to this relatively high um, you know, 3.0 that we see. And then we also see in epidemiology, and again, thanks to a lot of people, you know, on this call and your colleagues, um, different exposures, not GA, that are related to ASD risk or other neurodevelopmental disorders in the F2. Um, that includes diethylstilbestrol, and that was um, linked to um, risk for ADHD in the grandchildren, so that's through the parental exposure. Paternal chemotherapy is really well known to be related um, to NDD risk. Uh, maternal solvent exposure has been seen in epidemiological studies to be uh, related to ASD risk in offspring. Uh, tobacco, uh, Dr. Golding did a provocative study showing a slight relationship. Um, paternal valproate exposure um, is uh, a, a serious question, and um, they're thinking of doing some relabeling and such in Europe because of that. So I'm going to turn it over to Alicia um, for you know, discussions of all these crazy variables before we really go on to like, what can we do? <laughs> what are next steps we can take? Alicia. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So um, w thank you, Jill, for that great discussion of general anesthetics. There were some questions that I thought we could discuss or some ideas that we could start off on. This clearly isn't going to be the last conversation we have. So, and you guys may come away from this, this conversation and have further ideas, which is great. Um, but uh, some of the things I thought we should think about was um, in F1, what would be the type of exposure? So Jill talked about general anesthetics, there could be others. Um, and, you know, again, she also mentioned other things that may be interesting to look at. Um, it could be related to the doses, the duration, or the repetition. Like, what is there a dose response? Um, what is the developmental timing? So, you know, whether it's, you know, during pregnancy or prior to pregnancy or for both the, the or gestation, I guess I should say, for the male or the female. Um, we also wanted to think about gender, right? So who's being exposed and when? Um, we also can't forget that um, genetics does have an influence on things. And so what sorts of genetic backgrounds are we interested in or we or are we interested in a specific genetic background? This is probably more able to be more specific in um, in model systems rather than humans, although we could also look at um, individuals with different family histories um, of different other kind of genetic findings. Uh, and I'm just thinking about, you know, background genetics that are done through regular health exams. Um, then uh, obviously there are other confounds that we talked about. So Jill mentioned everything from, okay, was it the event itself? Was it the treatment? Was it the surgery? Was it the anesthetic? What what was it? So what are some of the other confounds? So there can be family history of psychiatric or medical stuff. It could be other exposure variables. There could be things that people are exposed to in addition to whatever there is of interest. Um, so you can see as I'm talking, I'm hearing that the sample size needs to be bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and then also we want to look at uh, not just genetic background in F1, but also epigenetic background. Um, and then we also want to look at it in F2, which I'll get to in a minute. So both the genetic and the epigenetic, you know, biological background. Um, and then everything in between. So again, there 
these things are more able to be, you know, be specified if you were to do a model system, right? Because then you could specifically time and be very specific about the dose and the um, exposure itself. Um, but, you know, we also want to think about model systems. I mean, I mean, human systems. Um, so how do we, how do we at least control for them and how do we think about them? And of course we want to not just look at F1, but we also want to look at F2, the outcome of the, the, the conception. So, um, you know, we want to look at anything we can get in terms of brain. So we could look at anything from brain structure to things like EEG. We can also collect blood or iPSCs to look at um, different markers. iPSC research has really exploded. And so there's a lot that can be done by taking just a skin sample um, in, you know, one or multiple generations and looking at um, things that may not completely explain or be obvious in behavior, but might explain some behavior. Um, and then we also want to make sure that we're thinking about um, things that aren't just autism, right? So um, things that kind of travel with autism, that can be anxiety, ADHD. Um, we thought about learning disabilities or learning difficulties, things like gender dysphoria possibly. Um, you know, the other things I can think of is maybe even comorbid medical conditions um, with, together with the autism diagnosis, we want to be measuring comorbid medical conditions. Um, and that way we can also understand those in context of the family. Um, and again, also the genetic background of not just F1, but F2. And this is not meant to be an exhaustive list. This is meant to be the sort of thing that we totally understand um, will need to be accounted for um, because we want to think about how we can build a study like this and um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so we were thinking about, all right, if we could think about what sorts of cohorts could be used that, in, that encompass at least some of this information, right? So um, they include um, cohorts, registries, and electronic health records. So we can think about, I'm going to skip around here. We have someone from Norway. Are these international registry studies where you can link different um, uh, health registries, anything from, you know, a hospital health registry to a prescription drug health registry to um, some sort of other prenatal health registry, um, ways that you can link the different registries together. Um, how, is that possible? And what information and what limitations are there behind those? Um, there's also children's health studies. So um, I mentioned these because I was part of one in the 1990s, at least as a researcher, where we were tracking pregnant women or women who were going to have, who are planning on becoming pregnant. This was the 1990s or late 1990s. So 24 years later, those children, which we know about their exposures in that F1 are now, you know, not all of them, but some of them are going to on to have children of their own. These studies probably got didn't get funded for a while, right? Because the NIEHS and the EPA funded them for a certain period of time. Um, it may be hard to backtrack. Some of them continue to engage their families um, because they want to see the longer term outcomes. Some of them don't. So we would need to think about that. And then also there are cohorts in the United States, which we may be able to gather research from. And that includes things like um, the Mental Health Research Network and Kaiser. So Kaiser Permanente for your international friends is one of the largest databases of medical information in California and also I believe Colorado. I could be wrong about, there could be other states. I'm not trying to, in Washington. Um, so they have electronic health records and they have a mechanism for understand. And we have people from Kaiser on this call. I'll let other people talk about it. There's also something called the Nurses Health Study. This was formed, mm, I want to say in the 1970s, but I could be wrong. It could have been the 80s. And it specifically was um, nurses, tracking nurses' health and outcomes. And they would send surveys every couple of years to nurses to talk about their families, their children, their health experience. And they got a really robust return rate because nurses were, you know, especially cognizant of um, their own health and then also the need for research. 
Um, there's also SEED, the study to explore early development, which is funded by the CDC. CHARGE, which was one of the children's health studies, but also um, has been around long enough that maybe not everyone, but they could start thinking about the offspring of the families in charge. Um, also the state of Utah, there's a program right now called All of Us in the United States, which is meant to be a very comprehensive, it's, it started, um, it was to replace the children's health study. So they are collecting a wide variety of families from across different socioeconomic, cultural and racial kind of communities um, and tracking them for a number of years and trying to as best they can collect as many variables as possible to look at a different number of outcomes. And then SPARC, which is the largest um, autism research study that includes um, 50,000 people right now um, that has every intention of being longitudinal and can track um, self-report information about different exposures. Um, then thinking about you know biological expo biological data that needs to be assessed. You know, we Jill mentioned OO sites. I think it's probably obvious why OO sites are harder to to gather from human studies than sperm. But you know, what about adding sperm to different studies? And then the NIEHS, and we'll have to include them in a future conversation. Part of their strategic plan for the last one and the future one is around exposomics and better understanding of what people are exposed to at different developmental periods. And that can include direct exposures, that can include different, different databases where you can, um, like even exposure databases like air pollution databases where you can look at based on zip code, what people are exposed to at different times during development. Um, and even health records um, that utilize that exposure information. Um, because we want to start something, you know, we want to get things going, we do obviously want to think about the utilizing of existing data, including health registry data and electronic health data. So a health electronic health records are becoming more and more utilized by healthcare practitioners, and they're also including more and more information. So you guys probably have a better understanding of what's on a health record than I do or what some of these health registries, and thank you to, to Bonnie who mentioned that she's working with some of these registries um, and they exist in Scotland, I didn't even know that. So thank you, you might be able to comment more than I can about how what information is on there and what sort of studies are possible. Um, and then there may be other study designs using epidemiological, registry approaches or ways that we can gather information from different cohorts of people that I didn't even list here, that we didn't even think about, that you may know of. And so we're very eager to hear about that. Definitely. Next. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, just the final slide here, and then we'll move on to the discussion. I just wanted to put out there some of the study designs that have been suggested to me by different researchers. Um, and just very quickly going through these, just um, looking at an F1 surgery of a particular type, like I mentioned, like major appendectomies, you're know, looking at that and the autism rate in their offspring, um, looking at a high exposure group of F1s versus a low exposure group of F1s. I mean, you would need a lot of data to be able to ascertain that, but nevertheless, that would be a really cool, uh, cool study. Um, looking at the outcomes in their F2s to see if there is um, a difference, a significant difference. Um, how about F1s who had surgery between having their F2s? And again, these are specific to general anesthesia. I'm not saying that other exposures aren't important, but you know, just for this, just for now. Um, uh, F1 who had surgery between. So I've, I didn't include everybody on my slides, obviously, but I've definitely met a number of families who had typically developing children uh, one of the parents, either the father or the mother, had a surgery, and then the subsequent child had idiopathic autism. So I've I've seen it. Does it mean anything? I don't know. It would be an excellent investigation. Um, because um, early life is a very vulnerable time for germ cells, specifically looking at fetal exposure or early life surgery could be um, a really interesting question in and of itself. Um, and looking at F1, so the parents who are identical twins who have unequal, so have identical genetic background, if they have unequal exposure to surgery over their lifetimes, let's say one was in a car accident and one was not, you know, and they had surgeries and one didn't, whatever, you know, look at 
um, it, see if there's any differences in their offspring in terms of their neurodevelopment. And then, of course, um, you know, big data it seems to be a really interesting question, maybe just for hypothesis hunting, but also, you know, maybe there's a real study that could be done there. So with that, I am going to stop share. And um, we, we wanted to open this up. Um, for your observations and your ideas, you know, our, our goal is really, we want to see studies. That's our goal. We want to see studies being developed on these types of questions. And, um, you know, right now, I think, as you know, the vast majority of autism research dollars goes into genetics, you know, and genetics is important. Nobody says it's not, but nobody's really looking at non-genetic inheritance in any kind of serious way. And, that's what we're trying to do with this effort. So any ideas you have, comments, 